Coming up, an urgent call for sustainability. If we're going to do what we have to do in the short window of time that physics and chemistry allow, then it will be through systemic change that it happens. Environmental activist Bill McKibben explains the depressing state of climate change and tells what governments and private citizens can do. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Few people have influenced our understanding of global warming, quite like today's guest. Though scientists first clued into the warming of our planet more than a century ago, it wasn't until the release of The End of Nature in 1989 that folks like you and I began to take notice. The person who got our attention was Bill McKibben. McKibben has since become one of the world's leading environmentalists. In addition to serving as the Schumann Distinguished Scholar at Middlebury College, he's written a dozen books about climate change and had his articles featured in The New Yorker, National Geographic, and Rolling Stone magazine. But in 2007, McKibben decided writing alone wasn't enough. So he turned to activism. McKibben is the co-founder and president of 350.org, where he's working to build a global grassroots movement to solve the climate crisis. Let's start with how you got cued into this issue. Um, as I mentioned, the end of nature hit bookstores in the late 1980s. That was a time when not a lot of people were talking about global warming. So what first got you interested in it? My um, first work out of college uh, in the early 1980s I was the, wrote the talk of the town column for the New Yorker for five years. And so I spent my time wandering, you know, these, uh, the canyons of this city and enjoying it immensely. When Cy Newhouse bought the New Yorker and fired Mr. Sean, the longtime editor, I took the good excuse to move up to the Adirondacks in the wilds. And I fell in love with, you know, what is the great wilderness of the American East, spending all my time outdoors. And at the same time, I was reading the early science about climate change and realizing that this wild place that I was so in love with wasn't going to be as wild anymore. And at the same time, the th third element was that I was uh, reading for the first time uh, really the great American literature, I think, uh, of all literatures our contact with the natural world around us is, I think, our finest, and especially in, in contemporary time, well, all through, from Thoreau on. But to read Wendell Berry and Gary Snyder and Ed Abbey and people like that was revelatory for me. And so out of that, very quickly, came that first book, The End of Nature. Uh, I think I was 27 or 28 when I was writing it. Um, and, and out of that, and sort of unexpectedly came a, uh, you know, what's turned into a lifetime of, of work. And so your earlier work show, showcases global warming as what you say is a philosophical threat, something that could potentially happen in the future. Um, and you've written since that global warming is no longer a threat, it's our reality. Um, could you tell us briefly about what that reality is today? Where sure. are we? So far, we've raised the temperature of the earth one degree which doesn't sound like very much, and it really isn't. We're trapping about three quarters of a watt per square meter of the Earth's surface of extra solar energy. So less than one of those tiny white Christmas tree lights per uh, square meter of the Earth's surface. Turns out, though, that that taken in toto is quite a lot of energy. And it's been enough to melt the Arctic. One can safely say, I fear, that the Arctic is broken. Um, we've taken one of the largest physical features on the planet and dismantled it. And you can say the same thing about most of the other major physical features on this planet. I mean, the oceans, which are our very metaphor for vastness, and which even 25 years ago, we had no reason to think you could seriously change, uh, they're about 30% more acid, it turns out, than they were 40 years ago. The chemistry of seawater changes dramatically uh, as it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. Terrestrially, the thing that I think hits us most often is the simple fact that since warm air holds more water vapor than cold, the atmosphere is about 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago. That's a staggering change in a basic physical parameter of the Earth. And what it does is very effectively load the dice for more drought and more flood, both of which we see. So that one degree is a very big deal. One of the reasons it's a big deal is it gives us fair warning of 
what to expect going forward. We're not going to erase that one degree. In fact, the scientists who predicted what would happen so far are confident, robust in their declaration that unless we get off coal and gas and oil very quickly, far more quickly than any government currently plans, that one degree will be four or five degrees before the century is out, which in turn will raise just basic problems about the survival of our civilization. The agronomists think that from this point forward, every degree increase in global average temperature should cut grain yields about 10%. Try to imagine this earth with 20 or 30 or 40 percent fewer calories on it and then see whether you think any of the other things that we worry about, development, war and peace, uh, 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 hunger, women's issues, all the things we care about and hope about devoutly on this planet, whether any of them will have a chance of getting our attention. I think not. One of the, the pro things that I've learned in reading your books is that it can be difficult to read your book and sleep soundly at night. You know, a, a lot of what you describe is, is as you say, quite frightening. This so is my great <laughs> strategy, by the way, is yes. I unload my angst on everybody else, you know, <laughs> then I sleep like a babe. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I could, I could imagine that that, might, that fear might compel people not to act. That you say, well, things are so bad, let's do nothing. It's funny. I've, uh, I've never tried to instill fear, but I've never shied away from it either, which often is what the sort of communications professionals, you know, advise. Um, our, my point of view, and sort of since our point of view at 350.org, has always been that reality is what it is and we should describe it. And I think that people are actually quite capable of dealing with it. When we formed 350.org, we took its odd moniker from what the scientists said was the most carbon we could safely have in the atmosphere. Any value above 350 parts per million CO2, they said, was not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Strong language, stronger still if you know that, you know, outside tonight, every place on Earth, it's 395 parts per million CO2 and climbing about two parts per million per year, hence the melting Arctic. Now, we took the name because we wanted to organize globally and hence Arabic numerals were more useful than slogans would have been. But we did it against the advice of people who said it's too depressing. You're already past it and people won't understand it. They'll just scare them. and. To me, it was just more reality. To me, it was like, well, it's like when you go to the doctor. If you go to the doctor and the doctor says, keep eating like this and someday your cholesterol will be too high, very few people actually do anything. But when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, ah, look, you're in that zone where people have heart attacks now, that's the moment when people start taking their pill or, you know, eating their vegetables or whatever it is they're going to do to deal with their problem. And we've found that to be the case with, with 350. Only really, well, only, only a small percentage of people in that doctor's office say, I need an absolutely full disquisition on the lipid system before I go any further. And only really, really stupid people go home and search the internet until they find a website that says cholesterol is a hoax, you know, and, and doesn't exist or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, we think that, that reality in this case, not fear, is kind, of, is kind of a good motivator. But even if it wasn't, I mean, it just strikes me that it's the, at root the most kind of central ethical duty we owe each other is simply to uh, uh, tell the truth about where we are. So that we, I mean, if everybody understands in the end that we're facing an enormous serious problem that would be hard to deal with, and we just all decide it's too hard, we're not gonna deal with it, forget it. Well, that'll be sad, but at least we will have, uh, we will have made a decision, you know, a joint informed ethical at some level uh, decision that it's just too hard for us and we can't go on. My guess is if we can get people to understand, then they'll make the much deeper, more difficult, but more human uh, decision to do all that we can about it. Okay. That, well, you've said, in fact, in the past that individuals have a lot of ambivalence about growing green. And you've written that tackling climate change is a little bit like trying to build a movement against yourself. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how you at 350.org and how you yourself are trying to convince people to kind of put aside their immediate self-interest, say, and well, begin to prioritize moral considerations? Let's think about it you know, from, the, from the other way around. I mean, one of the things that, that we spent a lot of time in, in the environmental movement doing once we learned about global warming was suggesting to people a series of personal actions that they could take screwing in the light. I mean, I remember when I when my book came out, the other environmental book of the moment was called 50 Simple Things You Can Do to Save the Planet, which was a very American notion, both that you would save the planet and that the things would be simple. The truth is, though it's very important that we put in the right light bulb and change our lifestyles and drive the right car if we're going to have to drive a car at all and so on and so forth, you actually can't make the math of climate change really work that way. Uh, if we're going to do what we have to do in the short window of time that physics and chemistry allow, then it will be through systemic change that it happens. And hence, our moral duty, our ethical duty, strikes me as much less involved with uh, changing the light bulb and much more involved with doing the more difficult work of organizing to change those structures of power and systems that lead us where we are. Which leads one to the question of why, and this is, the, I think, in some ways the key question, why we haven't, as a society, engaged in dealing with this problem. Why there's been in Washington a 20-year bipartisan effort to accomplish nothing entirely successfully. Um, um, and I think the answer mostly has to do with the incredible power of the fossil fuel industry. This is the richest industry that the Earth has ever seen. I mean, no hyperbole. Exxon made more money last year than any company in the history of money. And what they, one of the things they've effectively used it to do is to make sure that their completely amoral uh, campaign of altering the planet's atmosphere it remains undisturbed. They're the only industry that's allowed to dump their waste into the atmosphere for free. Nobody else. Almost the mark of civilization is that we clean up after ourselves, you know, except if you're the fossil fuel industry. And because they don't have to, they're exceptionally rich, and they will defend that, even though it's now clear to them, it really has been for a very long time, the damage that they're doing. One needs always to understand just how radical that is. The world's governments have agreed that two degrees is as much as we should heat the planet. At most, it's the, uh, the red line they've chosen, okay? It's much too high since one degree has melted the Arctic, but two degrees are the one place we agreed on. Two, the scientists tell us basically with, with, with pretty much precision how much more carbon we could put in the atmosphere and have any hope of staying below two degrees, about 565 gigatons. Three, scariest, the fossil fuel industry has in its reserves ready to burn 2,795 gigatons, or five times as much. And they will burn it if they can get away with it. That's what their share price is based on. Exxon by itself, one company with, you know, 10 guys or something on its board of directors, has six or seven percent of the carbon necessary to break the planet. And they're going to burn it, and they spend a hundred million dollars a day looking for more. Um, that means that they are, I think, a rogue industry. Outlaw, not against the laws of the state, because they basically get to write the laws of the state, but outlaw against the laws of physics and chemistry. And understanding the kind of radicalness of that is really important. Environmentalists, in this case, are deep conservatives, trying hard to preserve a planet something like the one that we were born on to, Radicals work at oil companies. If you're willing to make your fortune by altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere, then you're engaged in an act more radical than any human act I can think of in the past. And that's what we somehow need to internalize if we're going to build the movement necessary to break their political power before they break the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, as, as much as you make this ethical argument, there is, in a sense, an ethical argument to be made on the opposite side, which is this notion that the, um, if we exploit domestic energy resources, for example, we will be creating jobs. 
And the criticism that's lodged against environmentalists is that essentially if we go down this path, it's going to be a job killer. If you wanted to cast around in our economy for what thing would create the most jobs if you devoted the resources to doing it, it would be rewiring our country for clean energy. I mean, you know, if, I mean, task number one is insulating properly every house in the country, and task number two is putting solar panels on top of as many of them as you can. Neither case is anyone going to ship their house to China, you know, in order to get it insulated. It's going to have to be done here by people who know how to swing hammers, you know, the people who are no longer employed building McMansions because we don't need any more of those. Anything to do with renewable energy is far more labor intensive than anything to do with fossil energy. The cost, the real cost, would be to those companies now making huge windfall profits selling fossil fuel, they could, of course, rejigger themselves as energy companies, not fossil fuel companies. And they'd do fine. They just wouldn't make the absolute historic profits that they're making at the moment. When we talk about Americans being addicted to fossil fuel, I think we basically have it wrong. We are, we use too much energy and we should use a lot less, but none of us care where it comes from. We'd be just as happy if it came from solar panels and windmills. The people who are addicts are in the executive suites of big energy companies. They're addicted to those profits right now. And until we put, among other things, a serious price on carbon that reflects the damage it does in the atmosphere, that internalizes those externalities, then we continue to have the greatest market failure and moral failure we've just about ever seen. And can we talk a little bit more about this notion of the green economy? Tom Friedman, for example, has come out very strongly in this approach that we can essentially grow ourselves out of uh, global warming through advanced green technologies. You are quite critical of that. My guess is that we may have waited too long to adapt just to, to just like, all we're going to do is, you know, toss out the internal combustion engine, toss in a windmill and carry on as before, you know. I think that that's going to be, especially at this point, hard to do. Unfortunately, one of, the, um, one of the privileges that comes with having written the first book about this many years ago is the ability to say, if only you'd listened to me then, you know, things would have been easier and that transition would have been easier. We're already kind of up against it in a lot of ways. My guess is because of that, but also because of the nature of the energy sources we're moving to, the world will look somewhat different in the future. And I, I think in many ways, somewhat better. Uh, fossil fuel, very magical stuff, but it's only available in a few places. It's highly concentrated, easy to move around, and therefore it's led to a kind of centralization of things. It made sense to build a big, huge power plant and bring all the coal there and ship the power out. Sun and wind are kind of the opposite. They're omnipresent but diffuse, just as we're seeing happily the rise of a local food movement that begins to challenge the hegemony of the kind of agribusiness model, so too we're beginning to see, and I hope we'll see much more, the rise of a more localized energy system. Uh, I look forward to that. If we're going to have electricity, are we going to be forced to have nuclear power in the future to offset the loss of fossil fuel? My guess, having looked at all of this for a long time, is that nuclear power is unlikely to be a very big part of that for two reasons. One, I, I don't foresee, especially post-Fukushima, a kind of political system most of the world that would let it happen. Even before Fukushima, it wasn't happening. And the reason basically had to do with cost. It wasn't, I mean, environmentalists helped shut down nuclear power, but really it was Wall Street that pulled the plug on it. It's too expensive. It's like burning $20 bills to generate electricity, you know? Um, and, and it requires, if you're gonna do it, massive government subsidy. And if you're gonna apply that subsidy, you're better off doing it with uh, other things that'll generate more kilowatt hours per buck. Now, that said, 
we should keep trying to figure out if there are some ways to do it that are uh, more acceptable than the ones we've got now. Uh, and people are, and you read about you know, developments on the fringes, thorium reactors and so on and so forth. But my guess is that in the time frame we've got, this is not going to be the place we go. The good news is we're getting really a lot better at using the sort of uh, soft renewables like sun and wind. There were days this past summer when Germany, which is the one large country, the one non-Scandinavian country that's <laughs> taken this challenge seriously, when, uh, when, when Germany uh, generated more than half the power it used on that day from solar panels within its borders. And this is, you know, I mean, many of you have been to Germany. It's, you know, it's sort of foggy and Wagnerian. Munich's north of Montreal, you know. Um, if one can do it there, one imagines that perhaps Arizona and California and Nevada and places might be suitable for this sort of technology. Fundamentally, I think uh, this is a global problem and uh, can't focus uh, particularly on the individual actions of the American government or any other single government. So you referenced some of the uh, potential geopolitical issues that might drive some sort of concerted uh, action. Therein, it seems to me, lies some sort of potential for concerted global action, but so far I would have to describe it as somewhat disappointing. I would describe it as pathetic. Um, the, um, we've done no more internationally than we've done in Washington. Look, to begin with, the reason, the reason at this point that American action is important is because we're the second biggest at this point emitter of carbon, and since carbon lasts 100 years, we're by far the biggest source of what's up there at the moment, and in per capita terms, we're the biggest emitters by far. No one's ever going to quite catch up with us there, I don't think. Um, so what we do has both great physical leverage, but also great moral leverage. I mean, we're the place where this problem started. If we can't agree to do something about it, it's a bit rich to ask the rest of the world to do something. Um, that said, if we do act, um, it's still going to be hard for the rest of the world, the poor world, to act. The power of the fossil fuel industry is one of the two huge obstacles we face, and the other is the gulf between rich and poor in this world, which was always a sin and is now a tremendous practical obstacle to getting done what we need doing. Because if you're in China or India or any place else right now, the cheapest, easiest way to repair poverty is to do exactly what we did, which is burn a lot of coal, because it's lying around and it's cheap, okay? And we have to, both out of practical necessity and out of moral uh, 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 necessity, uh, figure out how to help those developing parts of the world to leapfrog the fossil fuel era and go straight to the energy future. Uh, to do with energy, what people did with, say, communications, where we skipped the telephone pole stage and went straight to cell phones. It's going to be harder here because it's more expensive and whatever else, but it's quite possible to imagine and begin to see village scale solar, you know, that kind of thing emerging. And it's quite worth remembering that other countries have begun to make really far more interesting. Uh, uh, commitments to a renewable energy future than we have. China obviously has made lots of mistakes emulating our model, putting up lots of coal-fired power plants. They've also done more than anybody else in the world on renewable energy. By far the biggest installed renewable capacity in the world, a, a huge percentage of our renewable capacity, is solar hot water heaters in China. 250 million Chinese, 25 percent of Chinese get their, when they take a shower in the evening, the water is coming from solar arrays on the roof, compared with less than 1% in this country. Most of ours, in fact, the, most of that 1% goes to heat swimming pools. Um, <laughs> the thing that really brought home to me the um, craziness of this was a day spent with the uh, a guy who runs, a guy named Wang Ming, who runs the biggest of these solar hot water companies, He Min Solar. A very rich man now, but an engineer and a good guy. And uh, we talked for the afternoon, and then he, then he was describing his little sort of private museum of artifacts, you know. And some of them were pictures of him with world leaders and the sort of stuff you'd expect. But the dominant 
the place of pride was to a kind of rusting solar panel. Uh, said, Do you know what that is? No. That's one of the solar panels that Jimmy Carter put on the White House in 1979 to generate hot water and that Ronald Reagan took down in 1985 because he wanted you know, manlier forms of energy than that. Um, um, and uh, when I saw that, I was, you know, it just sort of brought home to me the, um, our political failure and the, the, the fact that we could lead in a different way. Copenhagen and the Great Climate Summit there in 2009 was the place where on a rational world this movie, this would have had a kind of good Hollywood ending. You know, faced with the invading aliens, the world would have come together to, you know, mount a concerted defense. And instead, it was a horrible failure. I was prepared to be, I was very depressed. But we'd brought the largest delegation to Copenhagen, 350 young people from all over the world. And many of them that last day just kept coming up to me and saying, don't be completely depressed. I mean, these were kids from places where reality intrudes more than it does here, you know? And they kept saying, we didn't expect to win this right away. We're up against the most powerful industry on earth. It stands to reason that they'll fight hard. We've got to go back and fight harder. Thank you. Thank you so much. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.